This morning is March 27th. It is 2016. Our message this morning is called Proxy War on the Sands of Israel. I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you up front that it is not uncommon for people to be offended when I preach. It is uh, not uncommon for it to go longer than it should. But it's also not at all uncommon for people to get filled with the Holy Ghost, for people to get healed, for people's lives to entirely change. William Booth said, you pray for a move of God and I am a move of God. That is either entirely arrogant or if it's true, it's entirely amazing. I would say that God is looking for men who want to make history more than they want to simply read about history. I am not at all interested in patting us all on the back, going to eat a chocolate bunny, and just moving on with our day. In the name of Jesus Christ, I am looking for an encounter with the divine. So I'm just going to step out on a limb and say it's okay with me if you do not agree with the things that I share today. It has always been okay. I just ask that you have the courage to at least hear the end of the message. If you have the courage to make it to the very end, then I don't mind an Elijah-like confrontation. I will call on my God, and you can call on yours, and we will see what happens. Amen? Amen. Proxy war on the sands of Israel. These are pictures of the Judean wilderness. When you're reading your Bible and you see that Jesus went into the wilderness, if you're from South Louisiana like me, that is not what you pictured. If you are from New Mexico, maybe it is what you pictured, but that is what the Judean wilderness looks like. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.10 says an extraordinary thing. He says, I want to know Christ. For him, that was not an abstract theological concept. He wanted to know the person of Jesus Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Come on, when we say power of his resurrection, this is the experience of his sin-defeating power. This is the experiential knowledge of the very same force that raised him from the dead. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Many people claim to know Christ, but they know nothing of the power of Christ. They only know the religious iconography of Christ. I want to know both the personage of Jesus Christ and experience his resurrection power and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. There is a closeness that comes when you endure something with someone. Many of you have relationships with friends or sometimes family in which you endured incredible things and it bound you together, it brought you together. I am excited about the opportunity to endure hardship for the name of Jesus Christ. I am excited about the opportunity to share in the same kind of suffering he did because it must mean that people think I am like him and I am like him. Otherwise, why would they treat me the way that they treated him? Becoming like him in his death. How many popular Christian pastors today long to become like Jesus in his death? In what way was Jesus killed? It was humiliating. It was excruciating. Far from the megachurch pulpit, he was scorned by all men. Would you be a friend of heaven if all men were against you? Do you choose the favor of the Father over the favor of your brothers? Or have you been deceived in believing that you can have both? Today we preach a very comfortable message in most churches and in most places. So Islam outpaces us all over the world. Because at the very least they preach a serious message. True or not, we will leave for that argument for another day. But it is at the very least serious. While Christians sleep in their pews. And somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. The hope of the Apostle Paul was that in knowing Christ, in experiencing his power, in living like him so that he suffered like him, and in living obedient to the end, even death, he would be raised just like Christ. He never prayed for the hope of going to heaven. 
He never prayed a sinner's prayer. There was never a decision moment at an altar with a decision card where somebody declared him saved. He had experienced the awesome power of Jesus Christ. That is my goal for myself. That is my goal for you. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to have a collision today. <laughs> oh, you didn't mean it when you said it. Say it again. <laughs> Look, we are very blessed in this church that we are multi ethnic in this church. Having preached in almost 30 nations now, I found out the only difference between people is whether or not they're filled with the Holy Ghost. But for some reason, those that have darker pigment in their skin lack the fear to speak out loud in public assemblies. While those of you that still resemble Wonder Bread sit in church <laughs> silently, it's okay to speak out loud. Lightning will not strike you. It's going to be all right. Curtis, would you tell these people it's going to be all right? You can trust Curtis. He's your brother. I have an uncomfortable topic to cover with you. This is an article from the Daily Beast, maybe appropriately named. It was written by a man named Matthew Paul Turner. So he's a man whose mama had high hopes for him. Matthew Paul Turner. And he wrote an article called Houses of Mammon. This is a very King James way to refer to money. The title of the article is Can't Fill the House on Easter? Try Handing Out Gadgets. What we see on this next page is a quote from the author. He is quoting a man in Houston, the creative director of a church. Did you know that there were creative directors in churches? Our creative director is the Holy Ghost. There was a time when hell sold Easter, said Thomas, the creative director at an evangelical church in Houston that he requested to remain anonymous. But not today. Nobody wants to hear about hell on Easter. I bet his church is right off of 59. Thomas believes that many churches have reverted to creating extravagant marketing campaigns and branding their Easter services because of competition. There are far more churches than there once was. It's hard to stand out. Do you believe it's hard to stand out? I stand out everywhere that I go. When others shut up, speak up. When others let up and back up, step up. It's not hard to stand out. The question is, what do you want to stand out for? Do you want to stand out for your agenda? Do you want to stand out for your local assembly? Or do you want to stand out for the awesomeness of the kingdom of God and its king, Jesus the Christ? It is not hard to stand out. It might be hard for the casual observer to discern in a mess of these kind of things. For instance, this is an actual church advertisement. Let me read it to you because the print's kind of small. The Dark Night, an Easter story. Bring the whole family for this raucous adventure as the dynamic duo discover the true meaning of Easter. Set to some of the great music of our time, this is an Easter service you will never forget. And that's probably true. I will never forget having seen this. Returning to our article, this is a picture of the article. We see using the walking dead for Easter as a way to break down some barriers for people who have a bland taste in their mouth from church or have been hurt in the past. Montgomery admits, that's the man who's speaking in this particular part of the article, Montgomery admits that a church mixing zombies with Easter is a bit ironic especially considering the popular internet meme show, showcasing Jesus as a zombie. But he says, we hope that our Easter service will break down some walls for the unchurched and de-churched population. Jesus Christ said, this is my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He didn't say anything about decorating the church with the themes of hell and hoping that you could blend in with the world in de-churched population. 
I thought it was ironic in reading this that it may not be as ironic as he thinks to have a church full of dead people. When the zombies don't work, let's try some free stuff. The article goes on to say, but if visual stimulation or pop culture doesn't interest potential attendees, how about free stuff? Sound too good to be true? Think again. For instance, all first-time visitors at Long Hollow Baptist Church in Hendersonville, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, will receive a $5 Starbucks gift card just for showing up. That might not sound like a big investment, but considering the fact that Long Hollow was planning 31 Easter services at five locations, five bucks for every visitor could add up rather quickly. I won't go into it, but the article then addresses whether or not it is cost justified based on the marketing benefits. By the way, do you see that little symbol in the lower left-hand corner? That's where the Starbucks logo comes from. We'll let you do your own research there. I would like to uh, present a church that is in Ohio. I could have chosen a church that was in Corpus Christi, who has an identical ad this year in the paper and online, but that pastor and I cross paths every now and then, and I've already offended him at every turn, so we'll leave his name out of this one. Ohio's a long ways away. <laughs> you may not be able to read this print, but I'd like to read it to you. We are giving away a car. You could win. Join us at World Harvest Church. We give an address in Ohio for Easter Sunday at 10 a.m. Goes on to say, this Easter Sunday, we're going to give away thousands of dollars in gifts and prizes in the ultimate giveaway. Because, you know, Jesus giving his life was just not enough. If the ultimate giveaway is cash and prizes, what is it when the Son of God dies for you? Come, before the service, register to win a Honda Accord, a flat screen TV, an Apple iPad, a laptop computer, an Xbox 360 Connect, and the list just keeps going on right on down to cash gift cards. By the way, it lets you know that you must be present in the service to win because that's where the drawing will take place. Now, if you're sitting here nursing your own denominational grudge, one of the churches that we've mentioned was non-denominational. One of them was Assemblies of God. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And then the last one that we mentioned was Baptist. This is a problem that is universal. Do you know why? We're so devoid of the spiritual gifts of the heavens that we have to offer carnal gifts instead. Am I the only one that is just disgusted by that? I don't want to spend my time on disgusting themes today, but when did the church of God become so puny, so pathetic, so powerless that we give away TVs to interest people? This man is Leonard Ravenhill. He's the kind of man that nobody liked while he was alive and everybody loves now that he's dead. They didn't like him when he was alive because you didn't know what he would say in your church to your church. But you love him when he's dead because whatever he said, you can apply to somebody else's church. We love our prophets dead. In fact, I was recently told that this was one pastor's favorite author. And my immediate thought when I was told that the church's goal was to make people comfortable was that I don't think the man would have liked Leonard Ravenhill himself. Leonard Ravenhill was fond of saying, the God of all comfort afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. So I don't believe he thought the goal of the church was to make people comfortable. While we're speaking about Leonard Ravenhill, the top quote is a partial one. And I want to tell you the setting for it. Leonard Ravenhill was commenting on a man's book in the 70s. And he was a secular author. And the secular author was lamenting the rise of what was then the beginnings of megachurches. This is before we had all of those scandals in the 80s where front pages of newspapers around the world were filled with all of the things they were filled with. And the secular author, who admittedly was not a Christian, said, I don't know if this is the church that Jesus Christ died for. Ravenhill picked up on that theme and he said, well, if he doesn't know, I do. 
He didn't die for this freak of a thing, this powerless thing, this pale, pathetic, powerless, putrid Protestantism that dares to label itself with his name. Well, how strong is that? This is the kind of man that you love to read when he's speaking about somebody else, but you wouldn't want to stand in front of him. He may offend somebody. I want to warn you before we read the rest, the best thing that could ever happen to you is you get offended enough to consider a change. How, how offended are you when you're told you have heart disease? How offended are you when you're told that you have cancer? How offended are you when you're told that there must be a life-changing moment now or you die? Well, how much worse should it be if you have a spiritual disease? Leonard Ravenhill in his book, Why Revival Terry, says this. As the church goes, so goes the world. The world is in a mess because the church is in a mess. And the church is in a mess because so many of its leaders and preachers are in a mess. The tragedy of this late hour is that we have too many dead men in pulpits going out to too many dead sermons to too many dead people. If our churches are not full of dead men and women, they certainly seem to be full of sleeping men and women. The church pillars have given place to church pillows. How can God move in such a situation? How can God work when the material in his hands is hard, unwieldy, and crumbling? If the church today had as many agonizers as she has advisors, we would have revival within a year. The church must first repent, then the world will break. The church must first weep, then our altars will be filled with weeping penitents. This generation of preachers is responsible for this generation of sinners. That is worth considering. Listen, I want to show you something that is not being told from pulpits. I'm going to go backwards. Susan, we're going to go backward to the ultimate giveaway. I put scriptures beside the ultimate giveaway before reading about Leonard Ravenhill. Consider this. In Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to whom? Who did Jesus say it to? If anyone would come after me. How, who does that leave out? Anyone. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So what happens if you come to meet him because you wanted an Apple TV? What happens if you came because the pastor was hot? <laughs> I can be confident nobody came in here to, well, one of you did. <laughs> Jesus said that to his disciples. In Mark 8, it is a synoptic gospel. It is a similar passage. Listen to the difference, though. Then he called to the crowd to him. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, who did he say this to? <laughs> First speaking to the disciples, then speaking to the crowd, he says exactly the same thing. In Luke 9, 23, then he said to them all, if anyone. My point here is Jesus' consistent message in any way that it was recorded, no matter who he was preaching to, at what time, uh, in any location. He said the same thing. The gospel is based on denial of self. The gospel is based on the sacrifice of all. It is based on marching with Jesus to the loss of life for the gaining of eternal life. And yet, somehow or another, we have replaced that message with a gospel of greed. How can we do it? We cannot. I wish that there were more men like Leonard Ravenhill, but his time is gone. It's over. Now... You are responsible for the generation that you live in. It's Easter Sunday. At least that's the way that the Gentile world re refers to it. I'd like to talk to you about the status quo for a second as we dive deeper into the word. Status quo was a Latin phrase, meaning the existing state of affairs, particularly with regards to social or political issues. In the sociological sense, it generally applies to maintain or change existing social structure and values. I don't want you to confuse what I'm saying today. Hatred of the status quo should not be confused with animosity for its participants. I have no ill will towards anybody who is participating in these things. They are deceived. If they knew they were deceived, it would not be called deception. If you know when you are deceived, then you are not deceived. Deception, by its very nature, means that you don't know that it's happened. 
<clears throat> which is why it's easy to forgive them. They know not what they do. If they do know what they're doing, that is a whole different ball game. And I do have rank animus for people that know what they're doing when they pervert the gospel. I'd like to share with you a principle just to keep in mind as we move forward, lest you get the wrong idea. In Exodus 2, starting in verse 11, I'll read it to you, and I rarely lie when I preach. 2.11, one day after Moses had grown up, somebody say grown up. He went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, glancing this way and that way and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses had an awakening to injustice. He had grown up to a place where he saw things that were wrong. But he didn't have such a mature view of what to do about it, did he? I mean, if Moses had started killing every Egyptian he met, met, how many Egyptians would he have to kill before he had liberated Israel? Probably not enough days left in his life to do that one at a time. It says he had grown up, but we can see he hadn't grown up as far as he should grow up. How about Hebrews 11 on the same subject? Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. My point here is that Moses grew up more than once. There's a certain awakening that comes that lets you know something's wrong with the world around us. Something is wrong even with the religious world around us. But there's another awakening that comes when we say we must put our hands, our trust, our, we must put our hands at the disposal of his hands. We must trust him. We can't kill every Egyptian that's doing something wrong or where would Ibrahim be? Actually, Ibrahim's doing things that are right. Brothers about to get married, an amazing man of God. I have great hope. For this evangelist who speaks German, English, and Arabic. Look out, world. Moses grew up and recognized something was wrong. Then he grew up again and recognized that his role was to side with those who would represent Christ. The purity, the truth of the religion. And trust that God would take care of what was wrong as he acted in obedience. Amen? You want to know what maturity looks like? It's Exodus 12, 38. I'm moving through these quickly because it is not our point, but it is worth noting if you're going to hear a blazing repudiation of the church world. In Exodus 12, 38, we see this very strange verse. Many other people went up with them as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. You know what this refers to? When the Exodus occurred... Moses first grew up and killed an Egyptian. Then he grew up and began to trust the Lord and only move when the Lord said move. By the end, Moses has grown up enough to let those who were in Egypt who wanted to leave, other nations, Gentiles, leave with them and join the movement. My point in speaking against what we see around us that is generally accepted is not to kill them. It's to grow up enough to stand and say, this is wrong and we side with Christ. It's to grow up enough yet to say, Christ will draw men and women from those settings into the purity of the religion and accept them into our number as if nothing had ever happened because that is Christianity. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. So we do not yield. We do not give way to the cultural landslide that is going on. Look at this. This is uh, my personal favorite. Just let that soak in for a while. We're going to have a helicopter egg drop, 40,000 eggs. There'll be inflatables and more. Because if the Son of God rising from the dead doesn't move your heart, then perhaps symbols of an ancient fertility goddess raining from the sky will do it for you. I'm not here as the Easter egg police. I love to eat those Cadbury cream eggs. Those are amazing. 
I'm not here as the social police. I would like to contrast that with the scripture that is standing immediately to its right. Matthew 28, 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. This is when they first heard the news of the resurrection. They were afraid, but also filled with Don't tell me what you need to do just for fun in church. Don't take it upon yourself to make church more fun. The devil does things like that. And he does because it's degrees off of the truth. Before long, why are people coming to church on Resurrection Sunday? Because there's 40,000 eggs raining from the sky. Is that what Jesus died for? a church that comes because there are eggs raining from the sky. This passage that we're looking at now in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen is quoted by every church, but no church thinks that it has anything to do with them personally. 2 Timothy 3, verse 4, I'm picking up in the middle. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. The scripture clearly declares that when we exalt our pleasure over the actual display of God's power, those who are in Christ should have nothing to do with us. Do you really want a first century church? Do you really want a church that looks like the book of Acts? Because in our entertainment-driven society, they may want nothing to do with you. Where did we get the idea that raising the dead was boring? Where did we get the idea that seeing legs healed was boring? Or watching a room full of skeptics have a total transformation of heart and get filled with the Holy Ghost in mass was boring? Or having a demon announce in languages multiple at one time that he will stop your service and you leave with a man set right in his own mind, no longer possessed of evil spirits. When did you get the idea that was boring? Well, it so happens that the churches that have exalted fun beyond the actual power of God do it because the power of God is completely absent from them. But nobody says that. They say, look at all of the people who are here. Yes, I see all of the people that are there. Which one of them could take your pulpit next week? Well, no one. We have to bring in a guest for that. Then why are they all there? I'm very excited that in the real church of Jesus Christ, inside of a couple years, we could take any man or woman in this congregation and they would be fit to deliver today's sermon. Competent in the law, prophets, writings, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. In only a couple years... Because we eat, breathe, and live the Word of God. It is our joy. Amen? I want to congratulate you at this point, lest you think me shrill. You wouldn't be here if you were looking for an Operation Dumbo Drop. Or if you needed a pastor to ride an elephant into the ceremony. Or the pastor's wife to dorn the neck of a giraffe to come in. I'm sure it's happening somewhere in the circus that is the church. But you came here this morning, as Pastor Sutherland put it, for a collision with the living God. I want to tell you boldly, you can have that. You can have an actual divine encounter because it's up to you. He said, as many as hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Not they might be, they will be. I refuse to have a Batman service because Batman pales in comparison to having righteousness fill you. Oh, amen. We're about to start. There was a question, question asked from the heavens on the day of the resurrection. And it's a question worth asking. This comes from Luke 24 and verse 5. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. 
What a frightening thing that you could be looking for Jesus in a place that is death and not know that he was not there. Perhaps that's why we have TV screens and cars and iPads and Xbox Connects to dazzle you with. Perhaps we're trying to hide the fact that he is not there. Because if Jesus Christ had wanted to give people Easter eggs with $20 bills in them raining from the sky, he wouldn't have had to die to do that. The question may be as pertinent today as it was then. The women were at least looking for the living. What would the question have been if they were looking for the great Dumbo drop from the sky or the car giveaway? What would the angels have even asked? At least they were looking for the right thing. I'm going to presume today that you came in here not out of familial obligation, not because Buddy cooked jambalaya, which is always a good day, not because of any carnal reason that you are looking for life. I'm just going to step out on a limb and say you already felt it. You may not know what it is. You may not know what to do. But the moment you walked into our prayer time and you got those strange butterflies in your chest and during worship, when the back of your neck began to stand up, the hair on it, you're probably already experiencing life and grappling with all of the reasons that you shouldn't be feeling what you're feeling in a place like this. Oh, welcome to the collision course with the gospel. It's always been that way. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Where did he get such teaching? How did it come to this? It's a good question. And the answer to that would take more time than we have, but I'm going to suggest a few. First, let me tell you that I'm not going to go into my whole montage about the King James Version of the Bible and its use of the word Easter, although it does not appear in any manuscript, not any manuscript. The word was Pesach, Passover. The Bible nowhere ever uses the word Easter, but King Jimmy and all of his infinite wisdom decided that since there was already a fertility... I told you I was not going to go into that, and I'm not. We're not going to talk about Ishtar. We're not going to talk about pagan things. I don't want to argue today about dates. Pastor Sutherland did a good job on Wednesday talking to us about the irony involved in our dates. In the Hebrew calendar, something like our April 22nd would be the Passover. In the Gregorian calendar, of course, we placed it today. In the Orthodox calendar, it would be on May 1st. I said, could we cut each other a break and just celebrate the resurrection every day? Could we actually just be focused on new life every day and not need to nail it down to one day a year? But how did we get into this position? It happened at the first council of Nicaea. Many of you learn what you call the Apostles' Creed. Many of you, uh, sometimes it's called the Nicene Creed. Many of you may be familiar with Nicaea, but not familiar with everything that they did there. Before we get into the Council of Nicaea, I need to talk to you about this bad breakup. Sometimes when people go separate ways, they forget all the things they loved about each other, right? So when you first get together, it's uh, how good looking they are. It's how uh, they just in every way meet all of your emotional needs and all of those things. And the day that they're leaving, you post on Facebook what a low down scumbag they are and you never loved them. There was a breakup like that in the third century. The rift began in about 160, but I, I, we can't go there. So before we get into the bad breakup, I want to say it's not necessary to deal with all of the ugly, extraneous details. I'm just going to spit out a few things that are pertinent regarding the Council of Nicaea. The early Greek fathers quickly forgot that Romans eleven eighteen 18 says the root supports us and we do not support the root. In other words, the early church fathers saw no need to maintain a connection to the natural Israelites and Jews. They saw no need for it. Does that make sense to you? It shouldn't make sense to anybody, but it is what they thought, however they got there. The church was being overrun with Hellenism and was beginning to be dominated by the powers of Rome. Anti-Semitism 
was undeniably a major influence and a lack of respect for the natural and national function of Israel dominated the meeting. Now, here's why I'm saying all of that. I am going to emphasize today on what some people call Easter, the actual correct biblical paradigm of Passover as the backdrop and what it means and why. Sometimes when a man who is a Christian stands up and advocates Jewish customs as being from God and to instruct us, others get the idea then that they're somehow Judaizing. Well, I'm not. I am a pork-eating Gentile. I won't go into my son's anatomy and physiology, but I saw no reason to alter them. I just happen to love Israel. I happen to love the biblical paradigm. Other times, when you begin to speak about the actual biblical paradigms in the Jewish customs, some go a different route. They begin to suppose themselves Jews, even though they were born in places like Mississippi. My mother fell into this. I love her desperately. I accept everything about her, but I do not accept her revelation. A DNA test, a, a 132nd, 164th, none of those things matter when you consider the word, if you were not raised as a Jew, you are not a Jew. A former mentor and pastor also fell into this quagmire. It doesn't matter to me if Jesus appeared to you personally, privately, and told you you're a Jew. That does not invalidate this scripture, and I'm going to read it, and then we're going to talk about Jewish customs. This is 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Nevertheless, each one, somebody say each one, each one. should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned him to, to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Say all the churches. All the churches. Now, who would that leave out when we say all of the churches? Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be, should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Hear this verse 20, it's crystal clear. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. It is not possible for a Jew to suddenly become a Gentile because he falls in love with Jesus, who incidentally is a Jewish king. It is also not possible for a, uh, a Gentile to become a Jew when he falls in love with Jesus. If you've read Romans 2 and come to an incorrect conclusion, you have the right to be wrong, but I would not fight very hard for that. There is forever a dividing line in history between Jews and non-Jews. Not as far as God's love, not as far as inheritance, not as far as, but as far as function. The same divide occurs between males and females. Pastor Wade and uh, First Lady Christy <laughs> have exactly the same worth to God, but they do not have the same function in the kingdom and they never will. As much as I love Pastor Wade, it would be a perverse idea to think of him having a baby, although somewhat funny. I picked Pastor Wade because he's the less pregnant of us two. <laughs> there is a difference. And one of Israel's functions is to lay down an archetype for the whole world to see. When you divorce yourself from that, ugly things happen. Let's talk about the last vestiges of Judaism. So there is a Wikipedia article that is in that little window, and I didn't want to put you through that. Having read and read and read and read and done it for more than 20 years, here is the pertinent sentence. At the Council of Nicaea, by endorsing the move to independent computations, the council had separated the Easter computation from all dependence, positive or negative, on the Jewish calendar. Let me summarize that for you. The early church fathers got together and said, we really resent having to hear from the Jews when we should celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We don't like that at all. In fact, we're pretty sure they're wrong for no other reason than they're Jews. A little anti-Semitism going on. So they independently fixed the date for Easter to always fall on a Sunday, even though that cannot happen since it was tied to the 14th of Nisan and that moves on a calendar. 
And they almost single-handedly ensured that you would never celebrate ever, ever, ever the resurrection at the exact time of year that it actually occurred on. Now, that may not bother you very much because one day's holy to one and another day not so much. Here's why it bothers me and why we're taking the time to do this as we move forward. It bothers me because when you begin to remove the standard, when you take away the actual schematic for the way that this is supposed to work, it opens the door for us to celebrate Batman Jesus. It opens the door for us to celebrate the walking dead Jesus. It opens the door for us to do whatever comes into our perverse little minds to do when God tied it to a specific people at a specific place at a specific time in history so that you would forever have that as the historical backdrop. Does that make sense to you? I want to show you a few scriptures rather quickly. Uh, by the way, all of these notes will be online if you feel like I go to them, through them too quickly. The crucifixion and the resurrection are the historical backdrop within Judaism of the events we celebrate today. Matthew 26, 2. I just did each one of the Gospels for you. As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Clearly, he was placing the crucifixion at the Passover. Is that clear? Somebody say amen if that's clear. Amen. Mark 14, 1. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priest and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Pretty clear Mark's on the same page with Matthew? Okay. Luke 22, verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priest and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Looks like Luke is in accord with Mark and Matthew. Now John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. All four Gospels absolutely place the week of the resurrection, the week of the crucifixion during unleavened bread, and they place it during the Feast of Pesach. That is important. It matters when you envision it. It matters when you interpret it. It matters how you present it. If Jesus was Norwegian, that would make a difference. If Jesus was Chinese, that would make a difference. The reason that he chose the culture that he did was because God had designed the culture. And it said certain things. It brought certain expectations. When I say 4th of July, what's something you think of? Shout it out. Fireworks, barbecue, what else? I mean, freedom. It matters whether it's the 4th of July as the setting or it's Cinco de Mayo. It matters. And God chose Israel's national holidays because there were certain themes associated with them. I want to show you a couple times the Apostle Paul speaks so clearly to this. The crucifixion and resurrection occur within three Jewish feasts. The first two are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. Get rid of the old yeast, that refers to unleavened bread, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. He's clearly portraying Christ as the Passover lamb, which would give you the idea that Here's the Lamb of God come to take away the sin of the world. Here's the Lamb of God that causes you to pass from death to life. It's His blood that would need to be on your doorpost for death to pass you by, for you to leave slavery, all of those things. He clearly is portraying it as occurring during unleavened bread, which would mean you're searching your house looking for any contaminant to get rid of it. See, when you divorce those two things, you get stupid ideas like you can come to Christ, but it's not necessary for you to clean up your life. You can get stupid ideas like you could just clean up your life and never come to Christ. There was a specific order. Passover, you have to be covered under the blood. Unleavened bread, then you begin searching your house for contaminants and throwing them out. If you participated in Passover, but did not participate in unleavened bread, do you know what happened? 
you were cut off from the people of God. There would be no debate for people uh, like, can Jesus be your Savior without being your Lord? That debate couldn't exist within the first century context because it had a historical backdrop. In fact, many of the arguments that exist within Christianity today could never have occurred until 300 years after their occurrence, we divorced ourselves from the Jewish uh, roots of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 27, a very important scripture. And then we're going to move on to some other things. Are y'all doing all right? Yeah. How about you, youth? Are y'all doing all right? Yeah. Do you know that in this church, the youth pray for people to get filled with the Holy Ghost and they get filled with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Did you know that in this church, the youth pray for people to get healed and they get healed? In this church, we can send our children to do what adults in most churches are terrified to do. In fact, I was meeting with the national director of AIM in Mexico, and he said, I don't know what to do. None of the American churches will come. I said, you tell them LCMF will send our youth group. That's what you tell them. He said, I could never do that. I said, well, give me the phone. I can. <laughs> so where's the first church? He said it was in Hope, Arkansas. Call him and ask him if there's a man left in Arkansas. If the church will not go where it is dangerous, then you might not be the church. If you're still protecting your life, then your life doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're still looking for a pastor riding a giraffe. And trust me, you can find one of those on most corners. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This ties the resurrection of the dead to the feast of first fruits. I'll talk to you about that some more in a minute. But first fruits was beautiful. It's when you reciprocated to God because he had given something to you. It's when you began to offer some part of your life back to him and walk in a newness of generosity, a newness in your life. First fruits was amazing. He's saying that Christ was the first fruits, the first offering of God among mankind. That's incredible. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in its own turn. Christ, the firstfruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Jesus' resurrection means that there will be a resurrection of those who belong to Jesus. Do you know how you could know that without any other scripture? Because that's what happens at firstfruits. You take one batch of your harvest... And what it means is there is a whole nother harvest out there exactly like this representative batch. There would be no argument about physical resurrection. There would be no argument about whether or not our hope is the resurrection. Simply by using the word first fruit, it would be settled for all time. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is the first serious problem that came on mankind as the result of sin. And so the beginning of your liberation from sin had to happen when someone showed that they had power over death. The resurrection is a key to everything. Let us look then at a three-day and three-night scenario. We've taught this many times through the years, so I won't do it today. I simply say that if the 14th of Nisan had been a Wednesday, and I believe that it was, Jesus would have been crucified and put in the grave Wednesday evening. That would mean that Thursday would be the first day of unleavened bread, and that is a Sabbath. It's what is called a high Sabbath or a special Sabbath. Friday would be a preparation day for the weekly Sabbath and a regular work day. Saturday would be your weekly Sabbath. Now, the reason that that's interesting is because when they got to the grave on Sunday morning, Jesus was not there. He had been in the grave from Wednesday evening to Thursday evening. That's one full day. Thursday evening to Friday evening, that's two full days. Friday evening to Saturday evening, that is three days and three nights. Now, without looking at a calendar, without having to argue all of those details, if you simply had read Leviticus 23, verses 5 through 11, you would find out that that is the progression of feast and that it can occur no other way. 
When you divorce yourself from the historical backdrop, you open yourself to all kinds of error. For instance, you spend centuries trying to figure out how Jesus could have died on a Friday in the evening, not been in the grave on a Sunday morning, and that is three days and three nights. And people coax themselves into believing it by supposing that they were Jewish idioms in the day that allowed for it. There is no Jewish idiom that allows for three days and three nights being from Friday evening to Sunday morning. And this is yet one more example of what happens when we get away from the tether to the truth that was the Jewish nation. Consider the major themes of the feast and their historical precedents. This becomes important for the things that I want to preach to you about in our remaining time. If Passover had been on a Wednesday and you were in love with Jesus Christ, the major things that you would be thinking about regarding Passover was the crushing weight of slavery your people had been under. Exodus 1, 13 through 14 talked about being used ruthlessly. The Hebrew words there are incredible that describe this. They're more vivid than ours, but I don't have time to do it today. But can you imagine that on Wednesday they had seen Jesus killed and the whole nation was thinking about the crushing weight of slavery, the murder of their children. And Exodus 12, 12 says, I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. For, for a Jew, Passover was about God siding with their nation and helping them. God judging the powers on the earth and the powers in the heavens and preserving them. Now, if you were a follower of Jesus and you're standing there on Passover, you would understand the crushing weight of slavery. You were still a, basically a slave to Rome. You would understand the murder of your children. There had been a slaughter of the innocents when Jesus was born. But judgment on a satanic ruler, you could be scratching your head going, I know that happened to Pharaoh, but I don't see any point in Jesus dying here. I don't see any, I don't see any victory in this. Can you imagine how confusing it must have been for them? Watching Messiah die and not knowing how that would result in judgment on a satanic ruler. Jesus had told them, he said, the prince of this world is coming for me. But the world will learn that I love the Father and do exactly what he commands. But they had not understood. Have you ever been in a position where Jesus has told you something but you didn't understand? By the time Thursday came, they would be in the Feast of Unleavened Bread searching their house. This is the time the whole nation focused on leaving slavery behind. The whole nation was focused on eliminating contaminants. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for them to try to muster up thoughts with the rest of their nation about how they were leaving slavery when they had just seen Jesus die? Did it feel to them like they were leaving slavery? Did it feel to them like they were getting rid of contaminants? How do you think Peter felt? Thursday must have been such a difficult day. Unleavened bread is also, according to Exodus 13, about dedicating your whole family to the Lord, starting with your firstborn son. How difficult that must have been. I bet they were actually thinking that perhaps they had wasted their dedication to the Lord the last three and a half years. But let me ask you, if Leviticus 23 says that three days, I'm sorry, rather the day after the weekly Sabbath, there would be first fruits. And first fruits had to do with celebrating God's faithfulness, reciprocating the Lord's gift, and looking forward to Pentecost. When they saw Jesus raised from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, all of the sudden, all the pieces began to fall into place. They could go, the crushing weight of slavery is over because I'm freed from my sin. They could say, the murder of our children is over because even if we are struck down, we will live forever. Regarding judging a satanic ruler, they could say things like the Lord has made a public spectacle of Satan. Regarding leaving slavery behind, they would no longer be slaves to sin. Regarding eliminating contaminants, the Holy Ghost would search their lives, not just their house, and rid them of contamin contaminants. Regarding their whole family serving the Lord. Seeing the resurrected Christ, whole families came to the Lord. Celebrating God's faithfulness, how hard was that when they saw Jesus resurrected, reciprocating the Lord's gift. They gave their whole lives for it. Looking forward to Pentecost, Jesus spent with them 40 days talking to them after first fruits about the coming of Pentecost. 
And then they spent 10 days praying. And they were so looking forward to Pentecost after seeing Jesus raised from the dead that on the day that they got filled with the Holy Ghost, 3,000 people got saved. The resurrection is what makes everything begin to make sense. If Christianity is dull to you, if it is boring to you, if you would rather be in a place where they are giving away jumbotrons, then perhaps you've never met the resurrected Christ, and so it just doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Now, something else would happen. At this point, Israel has to wonder, we've done Passover for 1,600 years, and there's an endless supply of conquerors for us. Egypt couldn't have been our problem because Babylon came and did the same thing. Babylon couldn't be the problem because Greece came and did the same thing. Greece couldn't have been the problem because Rome came and did the same thing. What if we don't need liberation from a Gentile uh, oppressor? What if our real problem is something deeper? Have you ever been in the position of thinking that your real problems in life had to do with your circumstances? Now, it's wrong to lie in church, and only one of you said yes. So the rest of you are either abstaining in silence or you've committed to a position that is a lie. Because your whole life, every one of you, your entire life, you have believed that most of what was wrong were the circumstances that you were enduring. i got to tell you, a man and woman were put in a garden that was perfect circumstances, but they found out the problem wasn't the world around them, it was the world within them. You don't have a problem in the world that relates to your circumstances. You just think you do. A real problem is what Jesus said in John 8, 34. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Your real problem is that you have not mastered your own thoughts and couldn't outside of Christ. Your real problem is that even when you want to do righteous things, unrighteous things are right there competing with them. So much so that we can believe we've done a service to God just by getting our heinies out of bed and going to sit in a church and hear about him. Even if it takes a Starbucks gift card to get you there, some kind of unethical bribe. Our real problem, friends, is that the domination that we have had has been sin, not Rome, not Egypt, not anything else. Don't you think after 1,600 years of Passover, Israel was beginning to learn that, beginning to think? They wanted Rome gone. But when Rome was gone, did it fix their problems? There's been a proxy war. It's been waging since the very beginning. Wikipedia, I put a cutout here just to show you. A proxy war is a conflict between two nations where neither country directly engages. Say, neither directly neither directly engages the other. While this can encompass a breadth of armed confrontation, its core definition hinges on two separate powers utilizing external strife to somehow attack the interest of territorial holdings of the other. Some would say the United States is in a proxy war in Syria. Others would say that we did that in the Cuban conflict. Others would say in Afghanistan we were in a proxy war. The idea being we don't put boots on the ground, but we're exerting our influence over people who are there. Do you understand what a proxy war is? Oh, y'all got quiet. It's 12.03. Wow, the sacred hour. This is the time where your gluteus maximus is exerting extraordinary force upon you, telling you that it's time to shut down. Of course, if we were watching a movie, you'd be just fine. If we were watching a sporting event, you'd be just fine. In fact, if we were doing anything the flesh loves, you'd be just fine. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said the week of his crucifixion. Can you not watch with me one hour? Then he went away, prayed some more, and came back. Church, are you in love with Jesus Christ? Yes. No, no, are you in love with Jesus? I'm not talking about Buddha. I'm talking about Jesus. Are you in love with Jesus? Yes. Then don't you give him less than what he deserves, not less of your attention, not less of your effort, not less of your devotion. 
and don't you pansy out like the rest of the uh, lollipops out there and simply give verbal assent. Prove it. Show him you love him. Amen? Amen. I want to show you some of the effects of a proxy war. In Genesis 3.1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Now who do you think was controlling him? Who do you think was controlling the serpent? In fact, when we read it, it's hard not to think of the serpent as Satan. Do you know that you make it all the way to the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 9th verse, before that serpent is identified as Satan? What does that mean in all the years before it? You suspected his influence, but the Bible didn't say it. You were pretty sure he was behind it, but he wasn't clearly identified. That's a proxy war. What that means is Satan was utilizing another instrument to do his will, and that way he could be hands off and have what some people would call plausible deniability. How about in Genesis 6, 4? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And afterward also, also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. We have an angelic defection that produces hybrid human beings on the earth called Nephilim. They're actually not descendants of Adam in that true sense, so they're not pure human beings. And you know what? While Satan may have been behind it, and we know that he was, because 1 Peter 3.19 lets us know that he was, he's not named there. Have you ever read Job and you're a little confused that Job says this in the first chapter 6 verse? One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, You dog, get out of my presence, we're at war. No, it's not what he said, is it? Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and back and forth in it. That doesn't sound like two people who are at open war. With one another. They have actual dialogue and they consider the outcome of each other's actions. It's not until Revelation 12 10 that we find out that Satan is the accuser of the brethren and he's been in rebellion. But in the book of Job, we don't even see that clearly identified. The point is, Satan always had a patsy, he always had someone to blame, there was always somebody else to take the fall. The proxy war through the century has taken on many scapegoats. We don't have time to go through them all, but a law of prophets' writings. In Exodus 17, Amalek was a tool of Satan, but Satan is not mentioned. In Judges 1, 7, Adonai Bezek, a tool of Satan, but Satan not mentioned. In Esther 3, Haman, a tool of Satan, but Satan not mentioned. Are you getting the picture here? Anybody ever been framed for something? You know, I, unlike you, was not framed. I actually did it. And um, my sister blackmailed me every day with the threat she was going to tell my parents until she had exacted enough slavery out of me that I didn't care whether she told my parents or, or not. Slavery had to end. That's a little bit what this proxy war is like. I was used of the devil many times. Never was I innocent. But we came to the place where the slavery meant I just needed to talk to dad and figure out how to get out from under the foot of the devil. I want to share something with you that you may never have considered. Okay, That's hard to do in a church this biblically educated. At least many of you are. In Luke 22, 3 through 5, evil finds a serious host. This is the end of the proxy war for a brief moment. Listen to the very specific wording used here. Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas. Say it with me. Then Satan entered Judas. Not oppressed him. Not a demon possessed him. Two places in the scripture, in Luke and in John, it says literally that Satan entered him. In case you think there's a strange Greek play uh, here in the wording, 
It means to enter like entering through a doorway. It means to enter to possess. This is unique in the New Testament. Even when people are possessed of demons, the word is demonized. It's influenced. Nowhere in the scripture do we see something this overt. Satan actually entered into a human being. Not a demonic minion, not an influence. He himself entered into the human being. And Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. It's extraordinary how often money is a root of evils. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And yet we're obsessed with having more of it. Hebrews 13.5 says so plainly, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. And when I say that, do your minds race to the physical possessions you have? Because that's not what he's talking about. He goes on to say, for the scripture says, never will I leave you or forsake you. Do you know what you have that's of worth? You have his presence. You have his approval. You have the king of glory. How could you lower yourself to want an iPad or want a car given away by today's charismatic clowns. You can only do things like that when the church is completely devoid of power. When the people are completely, we would say teetotally, ignorant of Scripture. And friends, that's because we value it so little. Satan has entered a human being. I'd like you to consider what he does. If when Jesus enters the world, we know what God does, in other words, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? Then when Satan enters a human being, does it tell us anything about his tactics? Consider this. Sin kisses you while it tries to kill you. That's worth thinking about. Sin kisses you. Well, it tries to kill you. The enemy is subtle and his arsenal is disguised in kind words, declaration of good motives, and denial of evil intentions. Look at what the scripture actually says about this. Matthew 26, 48. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. I would suggest that this is a signal in your life as well. You just need to learn to read the signs. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. Which part of greetings, Rabbi, would you find hostile? Which part of his action would you find hostile? He's kissing Jesus. He's kissing him, giving him a kind accolade, and proclaiming him a teacher. Do you know what else he's doing? Killing him. You want a little insight into Satan's schemes? He kisses you while he kills you. He compliments you while he kills you. He tells you that the very thing that you want, he's going to give you, but he doesn't tell you that it will kill you. And he will whisper sweet nothings in your ear while your life goes to hell, and you become so deceived that you don't even know that it has happened. Mark 14, 44, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. He's dangerous. When he finds out that I betrayed him, make sure you have a guard there. How could you spend so much time with Jesus and know him so little? The same way that churches can stand for his name, supposedly, and be so little like him. How about Luke twenty two forty seven? 47? While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Satan has entered the money-driven church, and he's done it with a kiss. Not one shot fired. It didn't have to be. He's entered the church through pagan marketing with a kiss. The kiss is all the people they get. I'm curious, have your thoughts been the same as Satan kissing your forehead? Has he introduced ideas to you that are going to put you to death, but they seem sweet in the moment? We have this little phrase in my house. 
Not real sure where its etymology comes from, but it's fun to say. Whenever we do something really stupid, there's two phrases that explain it. We say, it seemed like a good idea at the time, which means we know it's idiotic, but we were deceived. And the second was, what had happened was, <laughs> and it really doesn't matter what happened, you're acknowledging that you're a complete idiot. That's, that's how that works in my house. I don't know how it works in your house. And we hear it pretty frequently from the men in the house. The women are inherently smarter, more beautiful, altogether lovely. <laughs> but the guys in the house say it a lot. See, Satan is not so stupid as to tell you that he's going to do something through you that defames Christ. He might even, I, I bet if you had asked Judas, he would say the same things that people say in my office all the time. You don't know my heart. That's, that's not my intention. I didn't want to hurt Jesus. It wasn't really about the money. I mean, that was just a perk. The Bible says he got exactly what he deserved. That's what the Bible says. He got what he deserved. His own declaration about his intentions didn't save him. Well, what happens if you get what you deserve? It's incredible how easy we excuse ourselves of all culpability, despite all the evidence to the contrary. I say, do you lie? Oh, no, no, Pastor, I don't lie. I bet I could ask you any one of three questions in front of all these people, and you would definitely lie. We are inherently broken. We've been on the wrong side of this proxy war for most of our lives. This affectionate assault happens over and over and over in the scripture. We won't read them all, but Joab to Amasa in 2 Samuel 29. How are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasiah by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Of course, he kills him. His intestines spill out. He doesn't do it by a threat of force. How does he do it? By a display of affection. What if giving somebody a Starbucks gift card to come to church is like kissing them while killing them? What if it is teaching them that there is no sacrifice in the gospel? What if it's teaching them that the gospel is really all about them and not about Christ at all? What if ever so suddenly you could stand up before 30,000 people and say the gospel's not really about you. It's about us, really. And then try to explain it away later when out of the abundance of your heart your mouth spoke. Church, we didn't get like this overnight. This battle has been raging for 1,700 plus years. But you stand in it today. And how you stand matters. How serious do you take the word? I get criticized pretty frequently for being such a serious guy. But I can't imagine for a moment that I'm going to stand before Jesus and he will rebuke me for taking his word too seriously. Is there anybody in here that would like to argue with me about that? I'm told that our lifestyle is crazy. We don't sleep enough. We don't, I can't imagine that I'm going to stand before him and he's going to look at me and say, I really wish you had slept more, Eric. I really love him. I mean, I really love him. And you know where I get the most opposition? From Christians that claim to, but their lives don't show it very much. Those kind hate our kind. And you know why? Our existence makes you feel guilty. Sin is subtle until it's not subtle. I mean... Check out Absalom here in 2 Samuel 15, 5. Also, whenever anyone, anyone approached to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. That's a very subtle thing, one life at a time, just kind of moving away at it until the day that he declares a seditious rebellion. See, the enemy has not deceived the masses by painting a sign across the sky of what he intends to do. He deceives the masses by camouflaging his actions with kisses. Let me ask, do you wear camouflage in here today? Do you walk in here with Sunday best? 
You walk in here and say everything's all right, but you know that it's not. And you've already made up your mind that no matter what happens in the next 20 minutes, you're just going to get your family and walk out. Do you really think that the Lord of glory won't hold you accountable for that? See, I told you at the beginning of the service it'd be a collision course with God, and I wasn't lying. The good news is Satan's not the only one who entered humanity in the first century. 1 John 1.14, the proxy war is going to find its champion. The Word of God became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus Christ also entered humanity. Looked like a regular human being. In fact, Satan circled him in the desert. You can read that in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Trying to figure out exactly what it meant when he said Son of God. You know what it meant? It meant every time that he tempted Jesus to sin, Jesus hit him in the face with the word. Not a church platitude. Connect, serve, share. He hit him in the face with the word of God. Let me ask you, there's no mention that Jesus was packing around scrolls or an electronic concordance. What do you hit the the devil with? Do you have to Google it? Do you have to Google your response to the devil? Hey, Google, what scripture would best fit this situation? Or are you living in the word of God in a way that says your life comes from every word that proceeds from his mouth? Colossians 2.15 explains something to us. The cross of Jesus Christ and the week of the resurrection says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. Are you making a spectacle of the devil or is he making a spectacle out of you? Well, it's really quiet now. By the way, the historical backdrop and the setting for this is the Exodus. It's entirely likely that the Exodus occurred on a Wednesday. I can't take the time to tell you why today. But the 14th of Nisan and on the 15th of Nisan, they had traveled through the night and the day and they had reached a place called ETM. Then only camping when the Spirit said they moved day or night and they came to a place between Migdal and the sea. It's almost like Wednesday at that night they left. They traveled all through the night Wednesday. On Thursday, they came to a place to rest in the evening. And then on Friday, they traveled probably at night and day. And sometime on the first day of the week, they crossed the Red Sea. Probably took a whole day to cross it. That's because when they came through the other side of the Red Sea, Exodus 15, 6, Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. Exodus And the resurrection have the same thing in common. It is God exerting absolute, total dominion over the enemy of his people. I mean, absolute. Let me ask you, does your life reflect that kind of glory? Are you still a slave to sin? Do you sit in here today comforting yourself with platitudes that say things like, well, you know, we all sin, but you know I'm talking about a specific habitual sin in your life. You've promised it's not going to happen and you can't think of a month in which it hasn't. Maybe not a week in which it hasn't. And the whole time, oh, no, no, pastor, I'm good, I'm saved. You know why I know I'm saved? Because at a Billy Graham crusade, I raised a pinky while every head was bowed and every eye was closed. Well, behold the power of God. Your pinky was raised. See, our churches are full of people who are slaves to sin. And like Harriet Tubman said, I said, Miss Tubman, is it true that you freed thousands of slaves? She said, yes, and I would have freed tens of thousands if only they had known they were slaves. We sit in our churches confident of our own righteousness because of what we've heard. And we ignore what we're doing. Just curious when you think about these kind of things. Listen to the way that the writer of Romans says this. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. What did you think it meant, united with him in his death? Do you mean the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings like him in his death? In what way have you ever been united with him in his death? 
So, well, pastor, I got baptized. Yes, did the old nature really die when you got baptized? Pastor, I, I, t- I, I take communion. Yeah, were you doing more than eating grape juice and a cracker? Or did something really change in you? See, the sacraments save no one. They never have. They simply disguise a sinner as a religious sinner. Couldn't you stand here today and say, I know the power of his resurrection. I feel him. He puts down sin in me. I am no longer a slave. Can you stand here today and say, I share in the same kind of treatment that he received? Can you stand here today and say, I will be like him in his death, completely obedient, and my life testifies to it? Or do you sit out there just hoping to endure another Easter service while you call yourself a Christian? If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection. That is a big if. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. If you are a slave to sin, then you are not united to Christ. Being united to him puts sin under your feet. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. How do you know that you know the power of the resurrection? You are no longer a slave to the sin that had always mastered you. When you sin, it's the exception, it's not the rule. Saying that you're a saved sinner is like saying you are a pure harlot. The words don't go together. When you have been liberated from sin, you know the power that raised him from the dead. And you would never settle for a Dumbo Drop Easter service. John, the first chapter in the 12th verse, has got to be one of the finest things in all the world. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been read your Miranda rights, but it goes something like this for the few of you that have lived sheltered, protected lives. You have the right to remain silent. Whatever you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. You have the right to a court-appointed attorney. You know what they don't tell you? You have the right to become a child of God. You do not have to be dominated by sin. Pharaoh was not your problem. Sin was your problem. And sin has a monster associated with it that beats you mercilessly. And that's the fear of dying and being out of the will of God. And Jesus Christ can eliminate both if you cleave to him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In the proxy war that is the kingdom, he didn't just conscript soldiers. He invited family members. If you're related to Barack Obama, that might mean something to you. If you're related to Ronald Reagan, that might mean something to you. What does it mean to be a son of God? I bet you would care when people trash his name because it's your family name too. Let me ask you, whose proxy are you? As we sit here today, who is waging war through you? Before you answer that so quickly, examine the last week of your life. Were you extending hell into people's lives or heaven? Or did you try to remain neutral in the battle? Acts 26, 20 teaches us to prove our faith by our deeds. Look at Romans 6, starting verse 19. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. How How many of you would describe yourself as God's slave? You know, when we speak of God's will, you know what I hear in the church over and over and over? I'm praying about it. What do you mean you're praying about it? That's an excuse for not doing what he's already showed you to do. Hey, have you been baptized? I'm praying about it. (laughs) 
You didn't pray about whether you sinned or not. You just sinned because it's what you wanted to do. Are you a slave to righteousness? Or is righteousness still something that is uh, optional for you? See, a slave doesn't get a choice. I believe Jesus Christ owns my life. I don't have the right to sit and negotiate with him at the table of compromise. We're fond of saying in this church, the answer to the question is yes before we know what his question is. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, do you know why so many are hesitant to say you're a slave to God? Because you know you are not free from sin. This is the great enigma in the American church. We claim to be in Christ positionally and our lives show that we're not, but we're comforted by our pet doctrines. The first century allowed for no such ambiguity. It really is as clear as 1 John made it. If you are continuing in habitual sin, you're not in Christ. It really is that clear. It's almost as if John, the crotchety old man at that point, who had outlived all of his friends, said, let's cut through the garbage. No more Dumbo drops, church services. If you sin, you're of the devil. If you walk as Christ walked, you love him. Wow, are you comfortable with such a clear litmus test or would you prefer it to be a little more ambiguous? We were born disobedient and to be born again requires an obedient nature. Are you still listening? Are you still with me? Because yes. we're going to finish this real soon and I'm going to tell you what, I was doing great with the Lord this morning before I began the message. I'd be doing great with him while everybody is eating jambalaya. How you'll be doing is entirely up to you. Ephesians 2 puts this in a way that completely defines the proxy war. You're either filled with an unholy spirit or you're filled with a holy spirit. Ephesians 2, 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. What does it say when a whole church is following the ways of the world and calling it the kingdom of God? But just for a moment, let's take the searing spotlight off of everyone else and talk about you. You have more in common with the world or more in common with Jesus Christ? The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient the devil is not just at work in Judas. He's at work in all who are disobedient. What is so beautiful about the week of the Passover is that what had been vague proxy war became mano y mano, absolute battle, right two men facing each other. The devil operated with deception and a kiss. Jesus operated by completely surrendering himself to the will of God. And Jesus was completely victorious. And now God is filling people with His Spirit and people are born with an unholy spirit. When did you get born again and your whole nature changed? When did you get filled with the Spirit of God so that you had supernatural power to do things you had never done before? All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Probably going to raffles in churches. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Listen. Sitting here and knowing whether you're dead or alive is the difference between being given life or death. If you claim to be alive when in fact you're dead, the life of Jesus will pass you by. If you stand here and look alive, but you know that you're dead and say so, the life of Jesus will fill your very being. This is why it was so hard on the religious people and so kind to the sinner. 
because the sinner knew what they were and the religious were deceived about their very existence. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus that you could be an enemy of God and he would save you and fill you with himself so that you could be completely changed in your nature. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith And this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Why? To do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me ask you if you're in that category in here. Do you say, yes, I know beyond a doubt that I'm saved? Yes, I know beyond a doubt that I am putting sin underfoot by His power? But you cannot say without a doubt that you're doing his will. There's a conflict between the second and the third statement. The Bible does not define sin as saying something ugly. That is sin, but that's not the biblical definition of sin. The Bible doesn't define sin as clicking on something you shouldn't click on. That is sin, but it's not how the Bible defines it. The Bible defines sin as knowing the good you ought to do and not doing it. That's James 4, 17. So when you can sit here and say, no, 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 I'm saved. I know the power of God, but I don't know if I'm doing His will. Well, then you might be deceived and don't know it. What general would not let his soldiers know his will? If you sit in this church purposeless, You sit in this church and you saved and I know it and I just can't, I'll be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Shame on you for belittling his name like that. He didn't die for doorkeepers. He died for men and women who would charge the gates of hell and overcome it. And he wants to fill you with his purpose and his spirit. And the only thing that prevents him from doing so is the wicked religious thought that you're fine already. It's why we love men like Leonard Ravenhill after they're dead. He has prepared work in advance for you to do. I'm going to just stand here in a moment of transparency while Matthew comes to the stage. At this point, usually Bibles begin to close and, you know, it's like, let's sew this up, Pastor. We're all done. We're not going to sew it up. And it's not all done. I told you that if you wanted it, you could have a collision with God. If you stand in here and you're sure that what I'm saying is wrong, then let's have our Elijah-like moment. I'm not scared. I got born again because of one verse. It was Matthew 7, 21. And I had been in a church for years. I'd won Bible awards. And I could quote more scripture than most people sitting in this church can now. And I was absolutely damned and didn't know it. The verse was Matthew 7, 21. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom. Now listen to me, dear loved one. The last part is so important. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Do you know who makes the kingdom of God? The one who does his will. Not the one who raised a pinky. Not the one who made a church decision card. Not not the one who can simply quote scripture. The one who actually does his will. If you feel like I'm turning up the heat on you, I am. Because it's time that Jesus Christ got the church that he died for instead of this freak of a thing that is masquerading in his name. And I've reached a place where I'm walking around as a dead man. And that means I genuinely no longer care how people receive me. Every day is a gift. And if this was my last Easter service, I'm telling you exactly what I think. Because I care enough about you to know that it could make all the difference in the world. We began with Philippians 3.10. I want to know Christ... People think they know him. You might think you know him. What could you tell me about him? 
Well, what have you experienced of him that you say you know him? Just what somebody told you to repeat? Just a doctrine somebody else formulated for you? Or do you know him because you've wrestled with his nature revealed in his word in a way that has left you unsettled and yet comforted? A way that at times has comforted you and at other times has killed you? Do you actually know him or do you just think that you know him? A lot of people think they know actors because they see them on TV and they're shocked to find out what deplorable human beings they are behind the scenes. Do you actually know him? Because the difference is everything. And if you're deceived, you might not know you're deceived. So let me ask, do you know him? What evidence is there that you know him? And the power of his resurrection. The gospel of Mark says you greatly err because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When someone knows the scripture, it does not mean they've experienced the power revealed in the scripture. It requires both. You say that you know him. How do you know that you know him? Because 1 John says we know that we know him when we walk as Jesus walked. If anyone loves him, they obey him. Is your walk supernatural proof that you know him? If you're sitting here and you just cannot wait for this to be over, let me assure you, you do not know him. You don't know my heart. No, friend, I do and you don't, and that's the problem. Fellowship of the sharing in his sufferings. We want to share in glory, share in glory, share in glory. Let's talk share in sufferings for a minute. Which is easier, to share in glory or share in sufferings? What is the greater proof that you would know him? Suffering. suffering. Judas shared in miracles but did not share in suffering. Come again? Judas shared in the glory of the earthly ministry but did not share in the suffering. He was excluded from the kingdom of God. You don't believe me? Read Psalm 69. Oh, a great theological debate. Was he saved or not saved? There is no debate. There are simply men who do not know the scripture. Becoming like him in his death. If you believe you know him now, you better know him more every day. You better experience more of his power every day because the way gets more and more narrow and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you believe you've reached a place in your life you can coast, let me tell you, dear friend, you are dead wrong. There is no retirement from his service. And should you manage to retire, it's to better serve him, not serve him less. Your life is not about your comfort. It's about his glory. So let me ask you, do you know him? Are you absolutely sure on this day that we celebrate His resurrection that you will stand with Him in our resurrection? Or do you only hope it to be so? See, if you only hope it to be so, then you may be sitting here among saved people damned. Now, I could have given you a Starbucks card to get you in here. promise you another one next week. But what good would that do you if you burn for an eternity and shame him by being called by his name for the rest of your life? You want to know what is fun? It's not Operation Giraffe Drop. You know what's fun? To know that you know that you know you're right with God. Amen. There is no substitute for that glorious power that is revealed in the weakness of ordinary human beings so that we can be standing in an African countryside with demonic powers manifesting around us and even our children feel full of resurrection power, cast out demons and pray for people to get healed and they do. You know who is not interested in fun church services? Our youth group. It might be time to examine your Christian walk for a minute if, in fact, it's Christian at all. And if you stand in here today and you say, I'm not a Christian, Eric, and I know it, I have far more respect for you than the ones that claim to be in or not. But I'm still going to invite you to the Elijah-like moment. You can call on Allah 
I will call on Jesus Christ. You can call on Buddha. I will call on Jesus Christ. You can cling to Muhammad. I will cling to Jesus Christ. And we will see what the outcome of our lives is. I have absolutely no fear because I know him. I don't hope. I know him. Could you stand to your feet?